they live, where they work the first days of the week. And Sunday, because European feudalism was capitalist, they rested and went to church. Okay, now Marx said, here is another exploitative system. Because the time the worker, the, the serf works on the, the three days on his own piece, that's his, as Marx liked to use the phrase, necessary labor. That's the labor, the fruits of which he got himself to consume. It was those second three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that he was doing surplus labor. And that extra output, the output of those second three days, belonged instantly, automatically, to somebody else who wasn't to serve, the lord of the men. So there's another exploitative system. Now, before I get to the last, the final one, capitalism, before I get to it, I want to already remind you of what we said earlier. You can see where Marx is going, right? You can see a man whose passion was to build a society premised on liberty, equality, and fraternity, is noticing what? That it would be very hard to expect liberty, equality, and fraternity in a society where one group of people produced a surplus that another group of people got. What kind of equality is that going to permit? If you make a formal equality, we're all equal, but some of us work and produce a surplus that other one of us live off of, the equality is going to be unreal. It's going to be formal at best, phony at worst. That's what you can see where he's going. So now we get to capitalism, which is really where his theory starts. But before we get into the formal theory, which is next time, I want to take you through how Marx understood capitalism to be a distinctive and unique exploitative class structure. Like slavery and feudalism in that the people who produced output produced a surplus they didn't get, but yet different from them in how it organized the whole arrangement. The difference of feudalism and slavery on the one hand and capitalism on the other is that in capitalism, the one who does the work is not a slave, he's nobody's property, and he's not a serf. He's not tied to the land, he's not tied to an individual. He is, in the language of capitalism, free, a free person. And he works. And the way he organizes work is not to be somebody's property like a slave, so the master says, slave, do this. Nor is it like a serf in which he works part of the time on his own piece, and none of that. The way a worker works in capitalism is he enters into a labor contract, something which didn't exist in slavery and it didn't exist in feudalism either. He enters into a formal agreement, often written down in which he says, I will come and work for you, sir, a person, an employer, we call them. I will come at 8 o'clock and stay till 5, five days a week, or whatever the specifics are. And that's what I will do. And in exchange, you will give me money. At the end of the week, you will give me money. I will come and I will use my brains and muscles eight hours a day. I will work with whatever tools and equipment you give me. I will work on whatever raw materials you provide. And the fruits of my labor, the output that I have poured my creativity, my brains, my muscles, my very substance, that will be immediately and instantly your property. And I understand that if I take any of the output home with me at the end of the week, I get arrested. So you only have to give me a wage. I give you the fruits of my labor. Keep that in mind. The worker gives the employer the fruits of his labor. The employer gives the worker a wage. Now Marx does an analysis, which I will go through with you when we meet again. But I'm now going to do it in the simplest English I know. Because it's important that the idea be set in your mind. To grasp this, put yourself in a position you've probably been in in your life. 
You're looking for a job. You encounter an employer willing to discuss it with you, and you sit down with the employer, and you discuss what you'll be asked to do, and the circumstances, and the benefits, and you get sooner or later to that touchy issue, how much am I going to get paid? And let's assume you work something out, and just that round numbers, you agree to work, and the employer agrees to hire you for $20 an hour to come for 40 hours a week to do whatever it is this employer's business involves. You know what Marx is about to teach you. You already know. But you live in a culture which perhaps has prevented you from fully thinking about what I'm about to say. But you knew. Here's what you knew. There is no way on God's green earth that that employer is ever going to give you $20 an hour unless during that hour your labor activity produces more stuff for him to sell at the end of the week than $20 worth. If your hour only adds $20 to what he has to sell in his business, he would have to sell that product of your labor, get the $20, and give it to you. Leaving him with nada. He's not going to do it. They never do. You're never going to have it. There's only one basis on which any capitalist ever hired a worker. And that condition is, you've got to produce more for me than I pay you for coming here to do it. And that difference is the surplus that all capitalist employees are required to do. You don't produce surplus, you don't work. And if that results in your death, have a nice day. So Marx is saying to us, recognize that capitalism, even though the workers are not slaves or serfs, does replicate those two systems in this particular way, that one group of people, the employees, go to work on condition that they produce a surplus that the employer gets and the employer distributes. Most work in capitalist societies today is done in an institution called a corporation. The workers in a corporation produce whatever the corporation sells. At the end of the week when the corporation sells whatever it produces, it takes the revenue from the sale. And it uses it for three purposes. One, it replaces the tools, equipment, and raw materials used up this week. Two, it pays the workers a wage. Three, it has left over the surplus. Who gets that surplus? Who keeps that revenue? Who's the first one to get their hands on that portion of the revenue from sales that is not used to reproduce used up equipment and not used to pay the workers? The board of directors. That's who legally gets the surplus. And they then distribute it. Let me remind you, average size of a board of directors, 15 to 20 people, who can be receiving the surpluses produced by hundreds of thousands in large corporations, or any number in smaller. We have arranged capitalism so that it is an exploitative class structure. 